Hello, everybody. Dave Neal here, stand-up comic host of Bachelor Nation News, and we've got Clayton Eckerd warning fans to be kind to Zach Shellcross the eve or day of his premiere episode, January 23rd. Today, we're going to watch Zach search for love, but in the meantime, let's see what Clayton has to say regarding the cruelty he received from fans and how fans can best decide whether or not to send Zach and other alumni hateful messages. Follow me on Instagram at dneals, pa- patreon.com com slash Dave Neal for behind the scenes bonus content and as always Bachelor Rush Hour podcast. It's a new hit podcast and I did want to comment on it before I get into the Clayton story here. I like checking the uh, chartable.com. It shows you where the podcast stands. We're number 26 in entertainment news and of course we have reviews pretty much ranging from lots of five-star reviews and several one-star reviews. The one-star reviews always have to do with um, with politics. Content is really choppy and Dave talks too fast. I've been accused of this. Another reviewer said, I usually listen to podcasts at two times speed, but because Dave talks so fast, I only have to listen it at one times the speed. And I'm like, well, isn't that a, f- <laughs> you know, I don't know. I don't know, guys. But he said, um, this person said, if Dave ventures into wokeness communism, I'm out. Of course, today on the Bachelor Rush Hour podcast, we're going to discuss the Bachelor alumni's trip to the United Arab Emirates to see Beyonce perform in Dubai. Of course, you might not know this, but homosexuality is illegal in Dubai. And some of the alumni that went to the event brought their relatives who are gay. Would you want to go to a country that doesn't recognize basic human rights? Now, we got into that whole story. Is that communism? Is that wokeism? Are you kidding me? Communism? I think we need to educate our own about what communism versus, I don't know, social democracy is. But that's another video for another day. I just think it's funny that pretty much 100% of the non-five-star reviews we're getting on the podcast are due to people having different political feelings that I have, uh, which I don't know what that means. But but at least no one's commented on the sound quality. All right, so that's Bachelor Rush Hour, the podcast. Okay, so I appreciate everyone who's listening, and I will continue to share all of the positive and negative reviews. Thank you so much to everyone else who has reviewed the pod. We appreciate it. Uh, every afternoon, you can go catch those episodes. Link in the comment section below. All right, so Clayton talked about body dysmorphia. We'll get into that in a second. But here's what he had to say to Zach and to the audience. Good luck to this man tonight as he navigates the wild world of reality TV, that man being Zach Shall Cross. Something to keep in mind, he along with the contestants are human. So before you press send on a message voicing your displeasure for one of them, ask yourself how you would feel if someone posted that exact message about a loved one of yours. If the thought doesn't make you feel good, then consider not posting it, or at least don't share your negative thoughts publicly. As the contestants and or their loved ones do see them in your words, do leave an impact. I recommend instead sending the contestants a positive message into their DMs showing support. Those messages went a long way for me. Yeah, it's that whole idea of like, well, do you want to live in an echo chamber? Well, sometimes, yeah, if the echo chamber involves people not harassing me, my loved ones, my mom, my siblings, you know, that, you know, wouldn't that be nice? We've literally seen the psychopathic nature that exists with very few, yet it, you know, with, so if, if 5 million people watch this show and, and your mom gets 100 DMs saying, oh, you're a horrible person, that's still crazy, right? That's crazy that we live in a society where someone on the show can do something you like or dislike and you can go to Shanae's page and see who her dad is and send him messages like, you raised a daughter like this? That's what I consider to be batshit wild. And of course, people of course say that through the anonymity of um, the safety of a private DM on Instagram. No one says that to anybody's face and yet it still hurts. It still hurts. So Clayton said this about body dysmorphia. He said, body dysmorphia is a tricky matter. He posted this photo of him guessing as a young teen here, skinny boy. We see what others don't, but can't seem to convince our minds otherwise. I remember seeing this picture back when it was first taken and being ashamed with how my body looked. I thought my stomach area sides looked fat. I look at it now and see a kid that was skinny but could have benefited from putting on some good weight. But back then, my eyes saw it differently. And now today, I sometimes see myself in the mirror and feel that I could benefit from losing weight. But no matter if I gain or lose, the body dysmorphia persists. It feels like a game I can't win. I've tried to beat it over the years by amassing as much muscle as I can while cutting body fat. I've even gotten down to 10% body fat and still thought I was fat. Not even the numbers can convince me. I've learned to better manage body dysmorphia. I'm not sure it's something you ever truly overcome, but I'm holding out hope. I know where I must get to, to love my body for for what it was, is, and will be. I hope to see that day, but until then, I wish to 
share my story with you all, to use my voice to help someone else find theirs. And of course, Clayton is, you know, he played professional football and he's strong and big and tall and all these things. And yet at the same time, he, like many other people, look at himself in the mirror and doesn't love what he sees or thinks that what he sees isn't a reflection of what he is. Oh, I could get rid of this. We are our own worst critic. We normally will will not look, I mean, he's a beast. Look, he barely fits through the thing. He's just, you know, he's, he's in fantastic shape. But we look at ourselves in a way that is usually harsher than other people would judge us. You know, I've actually got this podcast up on Man, Mandy Martino's podcast page called Misery Loves Mandy, where I talked about my own, you know, sort of body dysmorphia that I feel. And I think a lot of people do, but I talked about, um, you know, not liking certain things as I've aged, not liking, you know, the, uh, my, my lifestyle sort of got sedentary the second half of the pandemic in that I was working from home and sitting down all day. You know, they say sitting is the new smoking, right? So now I stand up, I try to walk my I got my Apple Watch to make sure I get my steps in. So for me, the healthy version of body dysmorphia, if there is a healthy way to control it, is to just try to put good food in your body and try to be less worrisome about the outcome. Now, with that said, do I still weigh myself every couple of days? Yes, I still, um, you've seen how I look with the analytics of the YouTube channel. I like numbers. But um, if I went from 195 pounds down to 183, which is what I've done so far in January by cutting out sugar, um, I really wanted to be at 175, but I go, well, you know, maybe I put on more muscle in my legs than I used to. You know, your body sort of changes, your hips get bigger. You, you put on, as men, men put on muscle in a different way. Like I couldn't, you couldn't, I couldn't put weight on when I was a teen and now it's hard to get it off. And I think a lot of people have those same problems. So, you know, I think the way to overcome it isn't necessarily to say, oh, there's no problem at all with my body, but it's to say, okay, look, here's how I am. I am the type to overanalyze things. How do I combat that versus trying to just shame myself into not thinking that way? And again, there's probably different ways to go about it, but I think the way Clayton's going about it is to say, look, I know I have body dysmorphia. That's going to exist. There's something that exists within me that felt this way from a kid. My mom always joked that her mom used to tell her a moment on the lips, a lifetime on the hips. My mom had a problem, you know, I would say probably has a problem with um, with uh, consumption the way that I do. You know, some people have problems with alcohol. Some people have all these other problems. And, you know, it's you're, you're meant to know you have issues. When you think you don't, that's probably someone who's blind to them and then trying to overcome them. So for me, the healthy way to overcome my issues is to say, I need to run more. I need to do body weight workouts. Not because of the way I'll look in the mirror so much as the way it my brain feels because, you know, we release dopamine when we work out and get fresh air and ground ourselves. And, you know, I, I live in a major city and it's, it's sometimes you don't touch grass for weeks on end and you need to remember to roll in the grass and love who you are. And so we talk about how inner child work enables healing and playful discovery, this article here, which Caitlin Bristow posted this three days ago, going to go love on her for a week. And by her, she means her younger self. Um, and what a lot of people realize is that we had a certain joy as children and we beat it out of us in our 20s and 30s and maybe 40s. And at some point, depending on where you are in your journey, you realize you want to love yourself the way you might have as a kid. And some people had horrible upbringings and they didn't have that love as a child. But inner child work here, as defined, uh, is talking about just like releasing ourselves from the shackles of what adulthood has made us. We have learned we have to learn everything as we grow. Children do that in two incredibly effective ways, experience and play. For adults who want to keep learning and growing joyfully to thrive in a fast-changing world, it might be time to reconnect with our inner child. No one's life is perfect. For some, reconnecting with a childlike learning learner might also require facing some more difficult emotions. Sometimes we learn lessons as a child that get in the way of open learning and adaption today. Adaptation today, that's where inner child work comes in. As children, we're, we act out our experiences, thoughts, feelings, and dreams through our play. Our creativity becomes the basis of how we prepare for the real world. Adolescence is a time of discovery, but it can also be painful. As we grow, we begin developing expectations of the world. Sometimes those expectations fail us. As, as people have talked about, psychologists have talked about how women experience more negative emotions when they go through puberty, probably a combination of the way society judges them, their body's changing, they're starting to get objectified, all these horrible things. And men or boys, when they're going, going through puberty, feel something diff different 
and yet similar, which is judgment from others, body changing, voice dropping, how embarrassing it is for young men when your voice starts to squeak and and, and people kind of laugh and they mean well, but like I couldn't imagine when I have kids how I'll act, but I want to nip those types of toxic behaviors in the bud where, where that could lead to body dysmorphia. But of course, we're all different and sometimes regardless of our intentions, we probably pass on toxic traits to our loved ones, right? Um, what is inner child work? Imagine that you're five years old. You're in school playing with the other children in your kindergarten. While running around at the playground, you trip and fall. The other kids laugh at you. You may not remember exactly what happened. You may not even remember who was there or how old you were. But what you do remember is the feeling of shame, the tears in your eyes, the pain on your skin knee. You may, may even remember saying to yourself, I'm never going to make a fool out of myself like that again. The knee may have healed, but you're dragging the scars into adulthood. You're no longer in control. 20 or 50 years later, your inner five-year-old is still running the show. Even when it might work to your advantage to take a risk, you can't let go of what happened on the playground, even if you don't remember it. So just a brief reminder to everyone out there that when we talk about inner child work and when we talk about overcoming the imprints we have from society, that that uh, toxic exoskeleton of bitterness that we feel because we were dumped at a certain age or because we had um, acne as a child or our parents got divorced, whatever the issue may be, we have to remember A, other people don't really give two shits about us, so just live your life. And B, you don't need to feel that shame. And the second we can shine the light on what it actually is, it just vanishes. It just vanishes and you can go on living a more authentic, meaningful life. And what might be more important to you is that you'll pass down some of that love to your children or your friends and your family, and you'll be a better version of yourself. And don't we all want that? All right, folks. Well, I've got a super busy day today. I'll be live at 7 p.m. East Coast, 4 p.m. Pacific for a pre-show live stream. And then after that, we'll have the after show live stream plus Bachelor Rush Hour. We'll have a comprehensive preview of today's first episode of The Bachelor starring Zach Shellcross. Won't you join me on Bachelor Rush Hour? Link in the comments section. And don't forget tomorrow, we're going to have so much bonus content on Bachelor Rush Hour podcast. We'll have the an in-depth recap, far more extensive than I can do on YouTube and you'll get to check that all out for free on Bachelor Rush Hour. All right, folks, one more video coming your way and then we'll get ready for tonight's episode.